Hey everybody, I'm Alicia Buss, host of Horsepower Empowerment through Connection. And today I have the great honor of getting to spend some quality time with an old friend of mine, Nina Ekholm Fry. She's originally from Finland and she came here as an immigrant 10 years ago. And she has been wildly successful as she has a great deal to contribute to our field in equine therapy and learning. She focuses on um, therapeutic human animal interactions as well as equine behavior and welfare. And she is a professor at the University of Denver and she's in a couple different programs there. And then she teaches equine behavior at Yavapai College. I know her from Prescott College from long ago, um, where I met her, I think it was just a year or two after she had first come to America, and she was already just so incredibly knowledgeable so many years ago, and it was such an honor to get to work with her during that time frame, and you know, it was funny, we hadn't talked in like, it's at least seven, maybe eight years until yesterday, and it was like no time had passed at all. It was so cool to get to catch up. And um, she has so many great things to share with us today. Um, so Nina, thank you so much for taking the time to get to hang out with me and all of the audience today. Thank you. It's great to be here. It's great to be back in touch. As you know, as you mentioned, we've known each other for many years. Um, and we met, like you said, in the very beginning of what's now coming up on a 10 year anniversary of me living in the States, moving here from Europe. So it's great to be here. Thank you so much. Yeah, and you've done so much. Tell so let's start at let's start at the beginning. So in the beginning, so you told me that you grew up in a village in Finland of only two hundred people, and yes. that you were actually a minority in Finland. Yeah, so I grew up on the west coast of Finland, and Finland has two official languages due to the fact that there is a ethnic and language minority in Finland who speaks a kind of Swedish that's a little different than the sw Swedish spoken in, spoken in Sweden, but is understood uh, across the border, so to speak. So I'm a Swedish speaking Finn. Uh, we have minority status in Finland and um, we have, uh, clearly I'm a white minority, which uh, means that if I keep my mouth closed, my skin tone doesn't really say anything about my, um, privileges or areas of marginalization within you know even global ways of looking at say skin tone for instance but um, within Finland which is quite homogenous sadly and quite white this this slight um, difference in ethnicity and background and language um, would play in at times but I should add too that we're um interesting minority as Swedish speaking Finns because we, we have some statistical advantages such as being happier and also having more wealth even. So it's a, it's a kind of a strange way to engage. However, as I had shared with you in a previous conversation, I have had a minority slur directed or many times actually directed uh. at me. Um, it, but it's, it, our, our culture bolsters or, or sits differently with me as a minority. It's not something I, I appreciate even mentioning it. It's not something I talk about that much um, because I am very aware of my overall white privilege. And even as an immigrant coming to the States and um, white folks in power in the States look at me as an American looking person because I am white looking, not knowing, um, realizing until I start speaking perhaps that I'm very much not an American. I'm a citizen now, but I've only been here as an adult and only been here for 10 years. Yeah, thank you so much for your vulnerability and sharing all of that with us, Nina. And you know, it's really interesting how people make assumptions too, because other people um, might feel like they couldn't relate to you because they'd be like, well, you're white, like you've never experienced the racial slur, right, as an assumption. Um, so all of us tend to make assumptions across the board at one point or another to different degrees. Um, why it's, which I think is so important to come to everybody with just like a clean slate and an open mind and asking people about their stories and seeing if they can relate and get creating that opportunity um, for people to learn about our cultures and how like we've been treated over the course of time and how each of us would like to be treated with our cultural norms, right? And respected mm -hmm. regardless mm -hmm. of where we come from or what our color of skin is or our religion. Yeah, and the main thing, honestly, that if you're white, your skin tone 
hasn't played in to the experiences that you've had. And that big visible marker is, is really what we, I think is helpful to center conversations around social justice on this uh, white driven concept of race, so yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And that's why, it's one of the reasons why I'm so excited to be doing one of my projects with the horses and creating promotional like, material through videography to capture people of color from all the different walks of life within the equine therapy field and introducing that to high schools and colleges so that more people um, can be aware of what it is that we do. And hopefully we can infuse more beautiful color and different cultural norms and stories into our otherwise seemingly white bread profession. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, representation is, is really important, being able to see a version of yourself um, in an area of work that you would like. And there's a number of reasons why black indigenous and brown folks people of color might have not ended up as much in this area of, of work, human animal environment interactions. There's, there's housing restrictions. Uh, there's racism in all, within all systems, um, yeah. relative also to understanding relationships with other animals, even yeah. down to, again, restrictions in being allowed to have maybe a dog in your housing, the kind of housing that's been limited and placed uh, to you. And that's, I think that's an area that I think about a lot as a, as a white person working with human animal in, environment interactions, um, facilitating more non-white representation. Um, because a, a small example within my own um, life is that I, I do farrier work. I, I work with hooves. That's right. part of, uh, not, not part of my, my full-time job at the university, but something I, I do as a, as, a, as a small business owner. And you know, we, I mentioned to you that when I grew up, our family had stables or a boarding stable, as you would say here yeah. in the States. And we always employed uh, women farriers. And that was really, I, I think that was a driving factor in me being interested in hooves, which I was anyway, but also being able to naturally imagine myself doing hoof work and hoof trimming and that kind of thing, because I had seen a representation in my case of a woman doing this work where for many the image that comes to mind perhaps when you think about a farrier you think maybe about well you might have all your own uh you know images but to me still it comes up as a as a man of a certain age and a certain skin tone and that's not me you know yeah. so so that's that's an area of conversation that it, with it with with my other white folks we need to be better at creating representation and room for representation in yeah. human animal environment interactions. Absolutely. Thank you for so much for that. And I love the work that you do. We haven't really gotten to talk to anybody yet that um, talks about equine behavior or the, like the science behind the therapeutic human animal interactions. I would love to get to hear more about the human, the therapeutic human animal interactions. Yeah, so part of my work at University of Denver's Institute for Human Animal Connection, where I'm the equine programs director, um, part of my work is within therapeutic or, or sort of human health oriented human animal interactions. And my, my main species is horses. My, my secondary or second area has to do with equine behavior and welfare too, but staying within this area, the idea that the inclusion of, formal inclusion perhaps of animal interactions into human professions or industries like healthcare, like education can really bring, bring a lot. That's a, a very defined professional area, but we can also talk more broadly about having abilities to connect with other species, you know, through, yeah. um, animal ownership or being having other kinds of connections with animals that don't have to be structured in a healthcare setting or a learning setting. However, part of my job is to, to run a, a post-master's program that does train therapists specifically <laughs> to include interactions, elements of interactions with horses that become possible into uh, psychotherapy as a service. So I do work quite a bit in that area. Fantastic. And how are, like, what are the, some of the, what are some of the ways that it affects the brain? 
Yeah, I mean, again, when we're thinking, if we're thinking about, well, I'll, I'll kind of center the, the, this part of the conversation about being on the inclusion of interactions with horses into learning or educational services, into coaching services, like life coaching, something that, that you work with, yeah. um, or into healthcare, healthcare industry, where there's a number of therapies and treatments that, that where professionals include interactions, equine movement that kind of thing. When we look at that area specifically, we can naturally see, huh, there are some things that I experience when I interact with another species that a therapist might be able to implement or almost operationalize, say, in, in psychotherapy. We have another, uh, other abilities to include touch and movement, which we know can calm and regulate and co-regulate ourselves where we might not do a lot of, of immediate touch or touch on certain parts of the body in psychotherapy because of the, the power uh, roles that we hold and being mindful and careful about those things. Yeah. Um, and there's other things like caregiving behaviors. You know, that, that's maybe a big part of when people have horses in their lives, like they lease a horse or own a horse using some of the human legal language here, but they're, they interact with horses and they feel um, maybe a tremendous sense of comfort in caregiving, uh, yeah. which is a basic human feature of a social mammal like ourselves, but it doesn't feel so threatening as it might do with, say, an adult partner. Oh, right. it might, it's easier with children. They have less power in, in their roles, easier with other animals to be vulnerable, to give in that way. So that's another one of those elements. And then we have you know, the opportunity even to just enhance our own way of working in psychotherapy with experiential elements, the practice of doing things, not just talking about them, um, the ability to experience other kinds or more kinds of relationships that the therapist who represents the primary relationship and therapeutic alliance between themselves and the client can help model or, 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 or represent so that the relationships within the therapeutic setting are healthy and appropriate between humans and horses and between, of course, all parties. So those are some of the just, uh, there's more examples, but just some of those examples that really tend to um, work really well with us as a species, neurobiologically, <laughs> touch, movement, relationships with others, you know, right. being, being minded, being attuned to. And we might sense that from another species, not knowing exactly what horses think, but we might, again, kind of bolster that experience through our long-term relationships with these domesticated mammals too. Yeah, and I remember we've talked in the past about like anthropomorphizing the horses um, and how people work through that experience. Do you want to touch on that a little bit? Sure. One of my favorite words, along with anthropocentrism, if we're tossing words around, they're actually <laughs> pretty pretty easy to 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 break down. Anthro human morph, you know, morph or morph change. into. Yeah, yeah, change exactly. So anthropomorphism when we perhaps assume that others, uh, non-human animals, and maybe even my car out there, have some qualities that humans have because we have our own species perspective. And without anthropomorphism, we wouldn't be able to really relationally connect with other animals. But we tend to sadly do the anthropomorphism kind of flop side. <laughs> instead of, yeah, which is very interesting. Instead of assuming that we uh, and I, I talk a lot about mammals because that, that's the category of, of animals, including humans that I work with. So, right. and I know that there's other, other animals too, like, like birds, for instance, who are, who are very much part of this conversation, but that's just want to preface that. But when we're talking, say, about a fellow social mammal, we can start with a basic assumption that their experience of, say, unfavorable emotions at times, stress, fear, trauma, really sort of is the same. And we can also, you know, make an assumption that enjoyment, um, calmness, you know, those kind of things are also shared. Dogs, cats, horses. So we should use our anthropomorphism for good and start there. But then on the other end, we also recognize there are differences, and especially with horses, 
when we are wanting horses to do stuff, yeah. very utility focused. We want them to carry us and respond or pull things, respond in certain ways, predictably, consistently. And it's in that realm where we have some differences that we then anthropomorphize more, <laughs> which, which makes no sense. Oh, the horse needs a human leader or the horse <laughs> knows what you want, but doesn't want to do it. Or, or the horse knows that they are, you know, providing therapy, which would be a very complex thing to first know that humans can have mental health issues. And then what we've structured as a formal way of treating those in modern times. And then that the horse can actually be included in that. And then that they're actually benefiting that person in the context of therapy and not just through a general interaction. That becomes a very complex chain that would create other changes in our relationship such as perhaps we finally need to give other animals rights under human law instead of depriving them of their so-called civil rights or or things like that so that that becomes very interesting anthropomorphism is rich and it needs to be tended to um, and then I'll just mention anthropocentrism because, hey, why not? Why not? Uh, same thing, anthro and center or centrism, kind of something that we need to maybe overcome at times. Uh, it's a species feature in humans as well, where if it's hard to imagine that something that's fun and entertaining as an example to us might not be a good thing for another animal. So, for instance, animals as part of certain areas of entertainment, as part of certain kinds of sport and, and competition disciplines, we might thoroughly enjoy it. And our anthropocentrism might get in the way of thinking, okay, I enjoy it. I feel good and happy. Is it possible that this is not so enjoyable and in fact, very scary and uncomfortable for somebody else? It's just a little cognitive barrier that yeah. we need to track. So anthropocentrism and anthropomorphism, uh, interesting things for us to reflect on with our abstraction and abstract thinking. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you so much for um, diving into those. What would you say would be like kind of in that vein, one of the things that you notice the most with your students when they first come in to learn about the equine behavior and welfare? And the human animal order. Yeah, yeah. If we talk about behavior and welfare and just thinking, thinking about horses, um, what I think a lot of folks start noticing, which is the same as sort of unpacking other things that you've taken for granted because of the, how culturally and socially you've been shaped. Yeah. So this, could, this can be, we can make a, a loose parallel to uh, oppressive structures being made visible within our species, for instance, human species. And when we go back and talk about horses and their behavior now, I think just folks realizing that, oh, it's possible to rethink some of the things that I've taken forth true, you know, some yeah. of the things that I've said, oh, these are absolutely certainly must be this way. This is how we train horses. This yeah. is how horses think. This is what's acceptable behavior toward horses and a lot of sanctioned violence uh, that is allowed uh, within parts of the equine industry. And it's so hard if everything around you, say you're at a, a barn, you know, somewhere where there's many people and horses and everybody's sort of bought into that same culture. Yeah. Everybody sort of does the same things. And you're also perhaps very similar in your own demographics and in-group kind of vibe going on. And it, it can be hard to transcend that and ask questions and wonder, huh, is this actually, is it reasonable to buy very severe horse equipment just from the tax store? You just have a $20, you can buy a, a bit that can saw through your horse's mouth. You know, is that a reasonable thing? Is it a reasonable thing that horses experience fear and pain and confusion uh, almost every time at times that they interact with a human and perhaps hope that that interaction, that time that the person comes to ride, hopefully ends soon so that they can go back to not experiencing that fear and confusion and, and unpredictability. You know, things like that. I think that's the biggest, biggest kind of, again, mental barrier to, to explore more. Could it be different? 
Yes, absolutely. And I'm so glad that you explained it in such a fashion. There are a few different directions that we could go with that. I'm like, which one do I choose first? Um, it reminds me a lot of why I find emotional regulation to be so important um, as individuals. Because when we're struggling to regulate our emotions, we tend to give off a lot of confusing, um, like mixed signals non-verbally, which is what the horse is reading. Um, so if we're able to have better emotional regulation and come back into our center and really focus and be present, then we'll be able to be giving clear direction for our horse and they'll be less confused and more likely to do what it is that we're asking of them. And also if we give them a signal um, that's not as precise as it needs to be, which is true for most of us as horse people, unless you're a master of what you're doing, but even then we all get to spend our whole lives evolving, um, which is great. One of the things I love about working with horses, but that horse is going to be potentially confused. And horses, they, a lot of horses, I feel like, give a lot of their heart and they want to do the right thing. And, um, but if you're present and you're let go of like your ego or you're able to be more humble and really listen to your horse and be like, oh, it didn't do the, what, exactly what I was asking. Why is that? And take a moment and like breathe and be present. Okay, and like, how can I ask and pay attention to myself instead of a lot of people being like, assigning value, like, oh, the horse is being bad the horse doesn't like me, the horse is dumb, like whatever they want to assign to that horse instead of just being willing to look at themselves and how they could do a better job. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, 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 you know, it's important to also remember speaking of horse culture, so to speak, or equine industry culture, that the way we kind of train and interact with horses is not about asking them for input. Um, as a default. It is very much about teaching horses to suppress emotions, which are at times not as visible through behavior because of, you know, just their biology, their species, um, their, the nature of how they live, their ethology. So we have a, a already subtle communication at times. We have, sure. we have a, a, a suppressing, teaching, training as suppressing emotions, and we don't ask for input. In fact, if input is given, <laughs> then we say, stop giving input or else, you know? Yeah, that's not what I wanted to hear. How dare exactly. you tell me that? How many times Ex have we experienced that with other humans? Hmm. And, and, exactly. And that brings us back to, to me, one of the key points, just because of my own lenses as a mental health professional, uh, somebody who cares about humans, uh, who cares about social justice, who who really works on my own white privilege or, or, and tries to connect with other fellow white folks around this uh, is really the, what you're allowed to do. So there's no really, because you have that power role versus horses as any yeah. human has, has, has systemic power over any horse, then it's like, yeah, you could maybe emotionally regulate and be a better human, ah, whatever. You don't do it because there's really nothing stopping you um, from being very dysregulated, from giving mis mixed signals, and from blame shifting onto the horse. And then you have a whole group of other folks with power who say, yeah, that's right. It's the horse that's hard mouthed, or it's the horse that's a training failure. It's not, it's not you as the trainer. Absolutely not. It's definitely uh, the other. Um, uh, and also the speed, like there's not a lot of patience. I feel like that oftentimes happens in the industry because people, it's very much like instant gratification, right? Like we, we, a lot of people start horses when they're three. Sometimes I even see people starting horses when they're two, which just breaks my heart because, you know, the, the bones aren't fused um, at those ages. You know, people don't often want to wait till a horse is six or eight when their body is actually like in a space to accept a rider, or if you do start a horse or at, at a younger age, like being super cognizant that you're only putting 20% of their body, their body weight on top of them and being extra soft, like in the flexion of the neck and everything else to honor like the like skeletal frame of the horse. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people just aren't educated and it doesn't make them bad people. They're just ignorant about those different pieces of the horse. And I know that there can be a lot of charge on the word ignorant, but that's just we're all ignorant about things until we learn about them. It doesn't make you a dumb person or a bad person. Like none of that is applicable. Um, but we just push because I think a lot of people have considerations about the cost of owning a horse and you need to have them producing something like some sort of exchange, right? Instead of being patient. And sometimes we go out to um, the fields and 
paying attention to your horse and is your horse in a space to engage with you that day on whatever level because you might want to ride and they just might not be in a space to ride and um how many times do we know it's like oh they're a little off but it's not too bad like I can probably still go on a trail ride like or do whatever you feel like you need to squeeze in to train that day for dressage or anything else that you're doing you know and um being really honest with yourself about what level that you are in engaging with your horse and respecting them in the process and why do you have a horse you know mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah yeah and and again tracking your own like you're saying tracking your own thoughts as when am i categorizing others other humans other horses uh, or horses in general as yeah. products you know am right. i what, what kind of mental am i am i sort of pushing them all out of the realm of of say sentient fellow mammal and into product produce perform realm yeah. and and a lot of the equine industry the way it's, it's structured is based on this idea of of you know sort of animal as product slap on a little bit of emotion and care you know and mental gratification kind of emotional gratification on our end from that and as you're saying this is not about necessarily um assigning that really strong right or wrong or you must do this or do that kind no. of thing at all but it's yeah. almost like feeling um, some sort of satisfaction in ourselves of noticing, oh, here I'm noticing that I'm categorizing as product. You know, I've stopped kind of interacting with the horse in a, in a certain way or I, I, or I, the horse, my horses are great. That horse over there is probably a bad horse. Or I like, I like cats and dogs, but those cows and pigs, they can just, you know, suck it. <laughs> So, it, but, so it's about being aware of it, but the, but the tricky part, again, what I love to talk about these cognitive barriers is that when we become aware, something happens, speaking of mental health and speaking of our own mind skills, we become uncomfortable. It's the and, best place to grow. And that area <laughs> of being uncomfortable is not something that we maybe go willingly into when we have difficult conversations about race and, and violence or when we have difficult conversations about human animal interactions because now all of a sudden we have a discomfort that we want to get rid of unless we have like you're talking about i know quite a bit about emotion regulation about other mental health features such as integration meaning making all kind of creating a foundation of, of of mental health like the you know bolstering your ability to suffer a bit less from this brain yeah. up here and the connected nervous system yeah. but so so that's the that's a tricky thing for us because when you have power and you can say i'm gonna skip being uncomfortable i'm a white person i don't care like i'm gonna skip being uncomfortable i have power or i'm a human i interact with horses and now i feel a little little nagging discomfort here or what's happening with my neighbor's horse or the horse next to my horse but i could also not feel uncomfortable and just go on with my day and that's the that's where i really commend folks who are willing to stay in that state of i feel this way these are my values these are my actions right now they don't seem to match do i can i stay with this process and really explore it and maybe create sustainable change in myself and an opportunity maybe to model to others um, what I what perhaps might be a, a, a rethinking of the relationship with horses. No, that, yeah, no, that's beautiful. Thank you so much for bringing that point up. And being in congruence can be very difficult for people because I think many people spend most of their lives incongruent. You know, like what goes on in their head doesn't match with their external experience in life. Mm -hmm. And um, with horses and so many different subjects, like people um, have a lot of self-judgment, like they should do a better job or, you know, like dealing with other people and the judgment that other, other horse men and women um, put on, like you feel like they put on them, on you. Would you may or may not? Like, I'm like, I don't know about you, but I've definitely experienced lots of different judgment in the horse industry um, because people can get very um, hyper-focused on um, the model that they participate in, be it like horsemanship or is um, like facilitating for like egal or natural lifemanship or whatever it is. Um, 
there's 150 models out there, ladies and gentlemen. I don't know all of them. I'm not going to listen for you right now. But people like anything in life, um, your viewpoint, they get really focused on that. And listening to people's viewpoint outside of that can be difficult. So when you go out and you're with those horses and you're talking about that uncomfortable spot and saying, like, how is my neighbor's horse being treated? And being able to be true to your own values without being antagonistic or invalidative of the human beings that you're um, that you may feel the need to have that conversation with, like learning how to be able to regulate your emotions, to be able to have a neutral communication cycle that is respectful, because you can be respectful to someone and not agree with what it is that they're saying or doing. Mm -hmm. but, yeah, absolutely yeah. and then you make your own choices whether it's with your pocketbook your money uh whether it's with, within your smaller or more intimate social circles you know what really what values what things you want and really that that peer support whether folks are in different states different countries i found very important when we start going into an area of of, of science really around equine behavior which unearths at its best unearths some of all or some of these human barriers and human misconceptions yeah. and human complacency and it's in that process um for instance through that equine behavior course that i that i teach throughout the 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 15 weeks of the semester that it helps to have kind of a social context to explore these ideas because it's so easy like we started talking about to just complacently fall back into that majority culture yeah. of of horses and horsemanship and and how that should look so yeah. seeking out those opportunities so that you can stand in what we say in swedish med wind so with the wind the wind is in your back so you can yeah. stand at times there because a lot of times when we learn more about horses and we're willing to look at our own privileges and we're looking to understand social justice context within human species and extended to the environment and other animals, it starts getting uncomfortable and it can feel a little lonely when you notice that you're working on something that perhaps not everybody is interested in even making change in. Absolutely, because there's that natural backlash from people that um, of the unknown, right? And they're like, but I'm really comfortable where I'm at and it's my life is good enough for where I'm at. Because even if it's something that they don't enjoy, there are things they don't enjoy in life that are really oppressive, it's predictable. Um, and there's comfort for them within that level of predictability. Um, and they're like, but it could get worse if I... Um, I address it. And yeah, like sometimes things do get worse before they get better because you have to honor that there's what you've been doing is not ideal <laughs> and that's not comfortable for anybody to sit in, but you're going to stay in that space until you're willing to address it. Um, and as my father always tells me, the way out is the way through. <laughs> <laughs> and sometimes it is too pause and rethink <laughs> yeah exactly sometimes you just have to sit there and be like okay how am i how am i gonna do this and i just it's really important to me to say again that i'm not invalidating anyone's process there are some yeah. things that are just um they're just true you know like i'm alive and you're alive and we all i love like paul smith always used to tell me like assume positive intent right Paul Smith was an incredible person. He's sadly no longer with us, but uh, he was amazing. I get a little teary almost every time I think about him, but um, he, he used to say that. And so sometimes when I'm struggling with somebody, I always, like, especially if it's somebody I interact with in general, I was like, assume positive intent. They're not trying to be it, you know, bleep, bleep, bleep. <laughs> yeah. It helps like, your own, it helps your own oh. state to it, perceive less threat, which helps you access more of your brain, which is a good thing if you're a human, yes. especially. Ex yeah, exactly. And just be like, okay, like clearly, if you assume positive intent from somebody, then it's just that there's a confusion somewhere. And if you can just be like, okay, um, like use the, like the Socratic method, right? And just be like, so what, is, what, is, what did you mean? Exactly, like, let's just like run into it and be like, and then I would repeat back to somebody my understanding of what they just said to me. 
and back and forth until we're like, oh, okay, now I understand. And it can be a really time consuming process, but if you repeat back to the person the directions they just gave you, it becomes blatantly clear where the confusions are in the eight, nine times out of 10, I found. Yeah, I agree. And, yeah, and then you can solve it and just like, oh, now we can breathe. It's just like Brian Albert. Oh, oh, thank goodness gracious. <laughs> and isn't it true, um, Nina, from the animal human interaction that is if we regulate ourselves as humans, that it makes it a lot easier for the animal to regulate themselves because we're yeah, less I mean, real and we're more incongruent. Yeah, we're, we're working with these common mammalian principles. And I might say a couple of maybe controversial things here. Uh, it, which I feel is like we already have, go on. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> so, for instance, uh, you said two words that I wanted to just touch on. You said predator, or predator prey kind of thing, predatorial. And you also yeah. talked about congruence. So, mm -hmm. but starting with this predator prey, most of us, when we think about immediate human animal interactions and especially inclusion of animals into structured services, special education, physical therapy, psychotherapy, you know, this kind of thing, coaching. Um, yeah you know these are domestic animal species that yeah. we're interacting with and it may actually do us a disservice uh, and them to play up this whole predator prey situation because just like we talked about with the mental image of a farrier uh -huh. when we talk about a prey animal we it might bring up a mental image that doesn't quite match the experience of a domesticated animal who may or may not in many cases for horses grew up <laughs> in a human environment and it might overplay certain things that then on the other uh, on on you know also make us act in ways that are perhaps not helpful uh toward them because again if horses had a sense of us as a predator species it would be very difficult for us to be handling them and touching them and we didn't eat them and you know it's very likely that horses categorize humans outside of that framework and just as this species that just does these funny things like touch spray fly spray on them or something you know like you know why do so you that's raid my tail yeah exactly other great horses example. don't raid my tail great example <laughs> so that's that's one little piece there's a there's a book on um at the time of, of filming this, there's a, it's in a process to be published by Springer on the welfare of animals who are included in therapy and education settings and in interventions. And I, my chapter is about welfare considerations for horses, naturally. Exactly. Um, and I discussed this a little bit relative to research that's been done on these cognitive models, uh, you know, and how they impact our interactions. And then secondly, you mentioned uh, congruence, which is quite a popular uh, word to think uh -huh. about in interactions with animals. And, you know, because I train therapists, I'm a therapist myself, yeah. we, we do a lot of role playing, you know, as in, in you know, graduate programs, you know, yeah. getting used to getting used to, you know, becoming therapists and that kind of thing. Nature school. <laughs> yes, yes. Yay, academia. So, <laughs> um, but in that process, I then find myself really thinking a lot about, you know, how what is a role play how are people actually are we different when we role play and you know things like that and interestingly enough i watched this piece recently that analyzed the uh popularity of the american tv show friends and sure. the the recent, my generation <laughs> yes yes friends <laughs> friends um the reason why perhaps this series was so popular was that in a lot of especially comedies or sitcoms there's very little um there, there's very much matching happening if somebody's upset they go oh, did you really mean that <laughs> that's all right you know there's a lot of like matching intentional for, made for tv matching between internal state and external expression of those those states but when we leave TV and we go into the world, there are a number of reasons why, say, horses mask. So I'm talking about matching and masking. Why horses ma mask some of their, you know, behaviors naturally, uh, emotions, so to speak, in, in, their, in their social environments, and why humans have various degrees of masking or matching. We tend to feel comfortable when people say, oh, I feel sad. 
you know, um, again, exaggerated versus, you know, I feel actually really like not great today. You know, and it's, it can be really hard to discern this, but that's, it's important to know that this is the human experience from our temperament, our previous history, our current experience, this, this, the sense of power um, and, and other areas of oppression. It makes sense. So then, oh, if yeah. We, yeah, so if we then take this idea that humans do mask and don't super match, and then we think about, wait, when we talk about congruence with human-animal interactions, you know, what is it we're actually talking about? Because at times we might think of incongruence as, I'm really happy right now with this interview. Like, like the, the projection of like, <laughs> that person is lying to me or they don't know what they're feeling. That makes them dangerous. I'm fine. You know, right. that doesn't yeah. communicate, those words and my facial expression doesn't quite communicate. It doesn't, it doesn't match, same. yeah. And that's really a main area of congruence that we may talk about in therapy and that kind of thing. As you know, obviously, when we talk about non-human animals, the words don't matter so much as just how we, you know, our, our kind of, our state shifts, whether we're a threat to the, the animal or not, because they know that there's a power difference. Uh, they know that they're smaller or larger, but still there's a power difference because of equipment, et cetera. Sure. So I think about this a lot with how to best talk about your internal state and recognizing that state and being intentional about how you present that state. Mm -hmm. And this, this kind of, um, can shortcut almost to say, oh, we should just be congruent, but that's not necessarily the human default even. No, so, yeah. absolutely. So that's what I'm trying to work on with people. I agree. It's definitely yeah. not the human default um, because of all kinds of societal norms that have created that over time. Yeah, for good, it, for good reasons too, for a lot of folks. For yeah. a lot of people, absolutely. And I can definitely honor that. And when I work with people, I just try to um, help create that safe, non-judgmental container yeah. for people to really look at that, right? Yeah. Um, because yeah. I think a lot of people anymore, they've created so many walls from themselves. They don't necessarily even know who their authentic self is. Mm -hmm. And it might not be safe or hasn't been safe in the past to socially share that. Exactly. And perhaps with uh, another animal, non-human animal, we might be able to share or feel what it feels like to be socially or relationally in connection while sharing some of that. But the key, like you've spoken to, is really about being able to track, do some tracking of our own states yeah. and notice that if we are with, with a horse, that we are noticing, I feel fearful right now. And that mm -hmm. doesn't mean that that particular horse will then mirror or mimic your, your fearfulness because right. that horse has their own history. They're like, mm -hmm. ah, human, humans are great. They give me some treats. That's all good. Or, I expect good things. Humans show up, they're this or that way. I don't, I don't care. I'm not going to be hurt by them versus eh, it varies. So maybe yeah. I should be a little more careful or in, in case of my, one of my horses out there, um, you know, really sensitive to state shifts and dysregulation and transitions. Very, you know, personal preference in, 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 in my horse to, you know, you should, you human should remain in the same state of mind, please. And if you're planning on, you know, shifting, getting excited, smiling, telling a story, I want you to calm down because, because my horse Shiloh has a, has a, 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 it's hard for him when things change and shift. It's a regulation thing. And that can be, that can happen to individual mammals of any, any kind, you know, any, we all have preferences and absolutely. Yeah. Some yeah. introverted people are just like, well, that extroverted person, me, for instance, um, is, <laughs> yeah, it is a little too much, you know? Um, and then other people are just like, oh my God, I love how like big and bright and excited you are about everything in life. And you're just like, sweet. Um, but also yeah. being able to honor it. Like one of my best friends is an introvert, but because mm -hmm. we have really great communication and we like, know that we come from a place of love and transparency and we're always really straightforward and we honor each other's boundaries. She, she doesn't have any sort of anxiety with me. And we always, 
yeah, we always get along great. And so it's, you can have amazing relationships with people that experience life very differently than you do, as long as you can transparently communicate with honor and have good boundaries. It's just yes, so and that, that, that statement where you're just going to apply, yeah, apply to non-human animals as well as human animals that very nicely put. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And the thing about your horses and um, how different horses have their own personalities, their own life story. That's why working with an equine specialist in these different models is so important because what the equine specialist does, of course, is to be able to know the herd of horses they're working with and be able to talk to the therapist or equine assisted learning practitioner about who their clients are. So we properly match people. So both the horse and the human have a healthy interaction in those different activities. Mm -hmm. and, and I would, you know, um, just also argue that it's important that the, again, I work in healthcare, that the therapist mm -hmm. is the person who is knowledgeable about horses because they're the oh, person as well. Who, yeah. yeah. Who they're the person who sets up and manages the, the treatment environment, their therapeutic environment. And in healthcare, it might not be appropriate to have another person with an individual client. And it's really right. the therapist and, and all that stuff. Yeah. It's really, it's really the therapist themselves that, they don't necessarily need to bring some of those principles or concepts from the equine industry into healthcare industry and the therapeutic environment that may include interactions with other animals and that the, the um, sort of tone setting uh, comes from the therapist. The therapist is competent in understanding, you know, relationships, being trauma informed in all their relationships, including yeah with those animals that they interact with. And they may or may not choose to have an assistant who they work with, but the default is that the healthcare professional with billable healthcare services really has all those skills mentioned and are not relying on a third person in, or second person in that sense, because yeah. then it can be difficult for a non-healthcare professional to understand the therapeutic environment. And if a, th a therapy professional is not understanding the nuances of power and privilege between humans or the nuances of mammalian experiences, which, hey, comparative health, their trauma can be experienced very similarly yeah. by other animals, then that becomes a, a problem. So that's one of those principles that I, how I work, for instance, and, 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 and look at things, especially, again, with individual clients or outside of groups, for instance. Oh, that's fantastic. Thank you so much for that, Nina. This is just such a by far like one of my favorite interviews. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to lie. This is just great. It's like all the things. And <laughs> no offense to anybody else. You've all been great. <laughs> More good things to come. There are just too. so many good things. I just, I love, I feel so honored to get to be a part of each one of these interviews because I learned so much as an individual and just also just being so excited to share. But um, speaking of environment, one of the other fabulous things that you do is designing equine facilities and consulting people with people um, for that, which I was just like, oh my gosh, this is so cool. So um, can you talk a little bit about how um, you partner with people for that and um, how you call it, like bring the, in the equine welfare? Yeah, absolutely. So something I do, again, as part of a uh, of my my own business is is equine facility design consultation and this means that i consult on the the design the placement the processes within or with rel relative to an equine facility now this can be a large commercial facility boarding place that kind of thing it can be a, a rehabilitation adoption center it can be somebody's private own property, just their, you know, few acre place, um, or it can be places that are being designed specifically to provide programming or experiences or, or therapy or treatment where interactions between humans and animals take place. And as we've as I've hinted at and we talked about throughout, there are parts of the equine industry that are driven by, you know, money and efficiency and that kind of thing. And sometimes they leave out this alive force <laughs> from the equation um, right. in, in ways, especially when it comes to the living environment, i.e. management, i.e. Mm -hmm. how horses spend literally most of their lives, there's factors left out. Um, yeah. uh, which basic, basic needs of horses. And interestingly enough, 
which is why facility design consultation is an exciting area to be in, we can actually increase efficiency and, and sometimes decrease the amount of staff you need to manage your facility by helping horses experience basic needs within their living environment, not just when a human appears to do a thing with the horse, such as dispense some of their additional vitamins and feeds or whatnot. Some of those things can be automated and more horse agency driven. <laughs> like the horses can have some agency in these things, how they, where they wanna place their bodies um, in, in the social living environment, access to things that humans create like feed, you know, because we engage and dispense energy in horses by riding them and exercising them. Um, there's a lot of exciting technology, but also just plain old, fence placement and uh, you know thinking of that and using small spaces uh, by small I mean under 40 acre facilities um, which is most of them I feel like which is most of them right to to help maximize the your lot size or your space while increasing welfare or the opportunity to have less negative states or persistent negative states and improving your financial kind of outcome um, all in one. So that's, that's an area that I work both, you know, with larger projects nationally, but also local, local facilities here in, in, the, in the Southwest and in Colorado. Nice. Because, I mean, how, I forget how many miles a horse typically travels in the wild. It, it just depends. Home range can be anywhere from like 15 to 50 miles, depending on the landscape, depending on the climate, depending on the time of year, uh, etc. Because free roaming horses is another one of my uh, professional interests, both BLM, I have a BLM Mustang here at home, oh, but, that's also, so cool. yeah, but also non-BLM free roaming horses, because the US has a surprisingly large number, not nothing close to what the kind of horses that are on BLM lands or on reservation lands, but but we have a surprisingly large number of horses who are free roaming. For instance, in eastern Kentucky, where I've been, where I've traveled several times uh, to work with local groups there around free roaming horses. So anyway, uh, sidebar. But that's that's um, speaking of roaming and unrestricted movement. Looking at free roaming horse behavior and looking at their time budgets helps us design spaces that make it less likely for the horse to be ill or sick. Yeah, or develop things like cribbing or wind sucking or any of those sorts of yeah. situations. Yeah, yeah, ways that when environmental pressure is too big and when there's inappropriate feeding occurring, oral stereotypes like cribbing and wind sucking tend to occur, they don't occur, and locomotory ones like weaving or head bobbing or pacing, yeah. but they don't occur in free roaming horses. So we know that there's environmental pressure causes the need to try to cope, whether that's this actually is coping or not has been debated scientifically. But yeah. I like to make um, working with uh, addictions and co-occurring trauma, one of my favorite areas, I like to make that that kind of connection between the arise, the, you know, people developing addictions, whether in behavior or with substances, um, as a way to cope from pressures of their environment, either early yeah. relationships or, or ongoing relationships or other features, even genetically, that, that make that coping look in certain ways. And the same is true for horses. And that can be quite exciting. Attached. Oh, yeah, there you go. Yes, speaking of attachment and, and coping and that exactly. kind of thing. Exactly, attachment yeah. theory. <laughs> One of my new favorite things that I'm excited about. Yeah. Oh my gosh, so many different things. Um, well, my friend, we have covered a vast amount of material this afternoon, um, and I'm just so excited to hear more. Are you going to be um, presenting at any retreats, or like, do you have anything that you would like to promote here today to the audience? Um, in terms of upcoming things, I found that my, my work schedule has changed quite a bit due to the pandemic, which we are in the middle of at the time of filming this. Yes, uh, yes. And, and um, I found that a lot of things sort of happen, happen a little more 
quickly, I have some things scheduled that are more internal events coming up um, this fall. But, you know, I'm very much happy to collaborate, to connect, to um, speak with folks in various settings, including, you know, I've done a, a lot of podcasts, a lot of virtual appearances, and, and my usual kind of academic presentations with colleagues at different universities throughout the spring and, and fall. Um, but in terms of larger events and, and more publicly accessible events, we, I think we'll have to look to 2021 uh, for those. Oh, such an odd year. Well, thank you so much for all of that. And if any of you are thinking about going to college, clearly you should probably go to the University of Denver so that you can hang out with Nina and uh, <laughs> learn more from her in regards to that. Oh, what a pleasure, my friend. Thank you so much for everything. Thank you. It's great being here. Great initiatives that you're working on. I know Thank there's you. a lot and, and many exciting things going on. And I hope that, you know, interviews like these ones can help bring light to that too. So I appreciate being here. You're welcome. Thank you so much. Well, have a wonderful day. Thanks everybody for watching. Bye.